Okay, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our monthly Ask the Director meeting. And to start us off, I'm going to invite our spiritual care director, Barnabas, up um, to start us in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday. Yes, it's a great day to be living. I really mean that. I know sometimes people say, man, you're always so happy. And I say, you know what? I have an opportunity this morning to breathe, to walk, and to be here. And so many people don't have the opportunity that we're afforded every day. So I just encourage you today to be happy and enjoy your Thursday because you never know when your next one is. So be happy. So happy Thursday. I didn't mean to say that. She said, oh, gosh. But that's just the reality. Be happy. You here. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Yes. So let me go ahead and pray for us and open up today with a good word. And we're going to go ahead and continue with our festivities. Let us pray. Oh, heavenly gracious God, we thank you for today. We thank you for joy. We thank you for laughter. We thank you for smiles. We thank you for all you have given us and continue to give us every single day. Right now, I pray that in today's meeting that we talk about the business of acts in a way that's loving, in a way that's kind. And um, that as we discuss our business, that you be at the center of all things and that all things um, give you glory in what we do. So, Lord, I pray for any individual today that's having any hardship, that you give them a supernatural peace and a supernatural joy. Anyone that's having a bad day, that you lift them up and encourage them and help them be well and be their best version of themselves. So thank you for today. And we ask this in your name. Amen. And happy Thursday. Thank you, Barnabas, and I, I would agree, it's all a gift, um, and we have to thank our blessings, so thank you for reminding us that it truly is a gift. Okay, so um, I have some great news I want to share with you. I um, want to share that we have special guests here. We have two individuals from Palm Beach County. We have uh, May Chang and Fatush Jafar um, with us, and they are going to be talking about our traffic light that we've been uh, requesting at our front entrance. But I, before um, I um, ask Fatush to come up, I want to um, provide a special shout out to Carol Posner for um, working with the county and helping us um, through this process. Um, she's been diligent um, in helping us, and we appreciate Carol's um, partnership with that. So thank you, Carol. So with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Fatouche. She is the manager for traffic signals and street light designs, and she's going to provide an overview of the traffic light. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just to introduce us, we work with Palm Beach County in the engineering and public works department. Within engineering, there are so many other divisions, but we are in the traffic division of the engineering public works. And if you need to contact our division, this is the phone number. It's 561-684-4030. Uh, and if you want to write an email, this is our email. We can provide it to your management if anybody needs to contact us for any reason. I'm Fatouche Jafar, and this is May, and we'll be talking about the traffic signal at Southwest 18th and uh, Blue Water Circle. In Palm Beach County, we give each of the traffic signals a device number. So this is our device number, it's 67503. It's when you ask for anything, if you give us the device number, it makes it easier for us to um, talk about, to look for information. So this is your intersection. This is what it looks like right now today. And we are working on uh, building the signal. So this is how we look at signals. We start with a design, that's a layout. If you see like these are where the poles are gonna be, Sorry. This. Okay. All right. So these are the poles that we're going to be. This is the layout of the intersection. This is a pole and this is an arm that's going to be there. And this is another pole with an arm. And there's another pole with an arm. And there's another one there with an arm. And each one of these will have a traffic signal on it. So when it's built, it's going to look like this. It's one of these structures that we call them mast arm structures. So these are the most sturdy structures 
for the hurricane, uh, if we get a hurricane. Um, we are providing a four-way pedestrian crossing, so all the corners will have pedestrian push buttons, and you'll be able to cross at all the corners. And there will be street lights at each of the corners existing. At northeast corner, there's a street light existing, so we're not going to add a new one. But at all the other corners, there will be street lights. So, and a, the project is to get it released to a contractor, we have to go to the Board of the County Commissioners to get it approved. They already approved it on March 14th, so we're gonna issue a notice to proceed to the contractor April 3rd. It takes us a while to get the paperwork processed, and then we give a contractor eight months to build the signal. But um, keep in mind, we ha could have reasons for delay during construction, Nowadays, everybody, I'm sure you heard about it. Because of COVID, we have a lot of material delay. A lot of contractors are get, not getting materials or not getting even workers to work with them. So bear with us if we have any delays. And sometimes there are unforeseen utility issues. We did the design, we investigated everything, making sure that we don't have any conflicts underground but sometimes when you start digging and you go 10 feet below ground and you find a pipe, by law, by OSHA standards, we have to stop and we can't dig and we have to put the project on hold until we find out you know, what that, who that pipe belongs to. Another issue is FBL. Sometimes we do our design, we coordinate with them, and then FBL delays us with hooking up power. So these are, in my 20 years with Palm Beach County, these are the main delay reasons that we get. Other than that, we should be fine. And within eight months, so by December, we anticipate this signal to be operational. I didn't give you a date exact <laughs> because I don't know. You always get delays during construction, but my best estimate is gonna be uh, December, our contractor is very good. Sometimes he gets things done earlier. He orders the materials as soon as we give him the notice to proceed. So we're hoping we can get this done. And it's in nobody's interest to delay the project for any reason because I want to get it off my desk and the contractor wants to get paid. So we'll be on it and trying to get it done. And that's the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, please go ahead and ask. Give me one second, please. Just one question per person. Have all the easement and right-of-way problems been solved? We have had most of the easements done. The north side, been, um, we've been working with the property owners to get the easement. They're working with us, but between attorneys having the discussions, we've had the issues with that. We have a contingent plan. If that doesn't proceed, we have all three corners except the northeast corner. So if that doesn't work, we have a contingent plan. We can do the change the design in after we start construction. But they showed that they are willing to cooperate with us, and we're just having the paperwork uh, proceeding between the attorneys and we are releasing it for construction based on the assumption that they have communicated with us that they are working with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you and for we're happy us. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Both of you for coming. Um, we know you are busy and we appreciate you coming all the way down, probably from the northern side of our um, county. So we appreciate the commute you had today to come and give us the good news. So thanks so much. And um, we certainly appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I have, um, I have a full agenda, and I'd like to kind of go through it, 
And after we go through the agenda, periodically I'll ask if you have specific questions. And, um, but I'd like to stay on topic. And then at the end of our meeting, this is kind of how I, I operate with my meeting, is at the end of the meeting we'll open up um, discussion to other topics, suggestions, um, comments you'd like to share. And we'll try to, you know, we'll try to keep this meeting to an hour um, because I know we're all very busy. You have other things on your um, agenda. And if you need to leave before the hour's over, um, by all means, we, you know, we won't hold that against you. Um, we understand that everyone's very busy. So with that, we'll um, start with our normal agenda. Um, we have begun to um, to recognize employees on a monthly basis, and we started in March, and we um, coined the phrase Act Signature Experience Team Player of the Month. And so every month we're going to recognize one team member. We're going to recognize one team member who um, is going above and beyond, who, who symbolizes loving kindness, who um, goes beyond their duties and also is a team player. And what we're going to ask you to do as residents is when you see a res an employee that's deserving of this recognition, we'd like you to either call us um, or write a quick note. You don't have to be lengthy on the note. Um, send us an email, but let us know what employees are doing that are that is deserving of acknowledging their efforts. So um, this is a way to motivate staff, also to recognize the good things that are happening on our campus. And um, we will honor the employee every month at our employee town hall meetings. We actually had the town hall meetings yesterday. And we meet with um, all shifts. So we actually come in at 6.30 a.m. We have our first meeting and then we have two in the afternoon to meet with the set, the first shift and the second shift um, and during those meetings yesterday we um, announced our team player of the month so um, today I'm going to share with you that we um, recognize Melissa Scott she is a registered nurse who works in Willowbrook Court she, oh good <laughs> Good to hear that. Um, she began her career with us in July of 2015. She was an LPN, went back to school, and is now an RN. And what's so special about her is that she wants to continue to learn. And she actually has taken on a new role, and the role is the care coordinator position. Now, that position, position is very important to us. Um, she basically collects the medical record that is sent to CMS for reimbursement. So our medical records we pull together and she is in charge of um, what we call an MDS and she has to create this MDS and then it gets sent to, to CMS for reimbursement. So anytime someone's on it, on a Part A stay in Willowbrook Court, we bill for that. That billing is based on conditions that the resident is experiencing, um, whether or not they're on therapy, how they're progressing, and her role is to pull all that information together. Now, the role of the certified nursing assistants and the nurses is to make sure that information she gets is accurate. So you can see that she has to make sure that what she's seeing and what she gets really reflects the resident who's receiving the care. So her job is pretty detailed. Um, so attention to detail is key in her position and we, um, we rely on her ability as a nurse to then go and see that resident and properly assess does the resident um, match what I'm being told on paper. And so she's doing all that. So uh, recently she was promoted and that's the position she's in. Um, her attention to detail, ability to handle multiple um, tasks is really instrumental in her success. Uh, she demonstrates a thorough knowledge of her responsibilities and she takes on more than is asked. So we're really pleased um, 
to recognize Melissa. Um, she was recognized um, in person yesterday. So if you are up in Willowbrook Court visiting um, a, a loved one or if you yourself are in Willowbrook Court, uh, please congratulate Melissa. And we'll be doing that every month. So um, when, you, when you have someone come to your apartment or help you in a special way, we'd love to hear the, hear the good news. So let us know. Um, speaking of employees, we are in the process of um, hiring a director of nursing for Willowbrook Court. We do have a final candidate that we're working with um, based on whether or not that um, and you know, ends in a good way, meaning that the person will accept the position. Um, we'll let you know as soon as we iron out, um, iron out that job offer and see if the individual is going to join us. But we are in the process of finalizing uh, the hiring for that position. Um, we have a letter, moving on to a different topic, and I thought I brought it, but I didn't. Um, we have a letter that is going out to uh, residents who own dogs. And in that letter, um, it's, it's a letter that just kind of bullets some expectations for dog owners. And the reason behind that is because we, you know, we have so many people who live here and we want to live in harmony. And dogs bring um, their own share of um, challenges, if you will, and so we want to make sure that we're all on the same page with dog ownership. We love having the dogs. Dogs are great companions. Dogs are great to, to pet and see and be, you know, be loved by, but we also want to make sure that certain rules are um, followed. Some of those rules, for example, includes um, being on a leash, so we want the, le the, the, the dog on a leash or under the control of the owner or whomever's walking the dog at all times. We ask that residents pick up after their dogs. I believe we have doggy bags throughout the campus. I know we used to and we still do. Marianne's shaking her head. So each building has the doggy bags. We ask the owners pick up after themselves. And we are um, having sort of a strict rule about the lobby. Um, we ask that you not bring your dog into the lobby unless you're going through to go to Willowbrook Court. Maybe you're going up to visit someone and you're, you're taking your dog and your dog is friendly and safe for Willowbrook Court. Um, then, of course, we understand. But we ask that you, you not stay in the lobby with a dog or stop in the lobby. Um, and that's simply because some people are afraid of dogs. Um, other people are allergic to dogs, and we just we're trying to create a harmonious um, communal environment that we can all kind of work um, work within those parameters. Any questions on that topic? I know dogs are near and dear to many hearts, and that might be a um, a topic you'd like to um, to uh, discuss. Oh, here's the draft copy of the letter. <laughs> okay, we have a, que a question. Um, my husband is on Willowbrook Court, and my daughter happens to be a therapist, and when she comes, she brings her little five or seven pound dog, and we go down to visit in Willowbrook Court, but it's there's really not a place to sit there. So many times we come in the lobby. Is it still a no-no if she holds the dog and the dog is? Okay. It's still a no-no because if if we allow one dog in our main lobby, then other dogs, you know, other dog owners would expect the same. So. Um, you know, but there is, by the elevators, by Willowbrook Court, maybe there would be a good spot. Um, that's kind of out of the way, but in the lobby, in the, this room, in the dining rooms, um, we ask that you refrain from bringing the dogs there. That I would just like to emphasize, uh, am I correct, that it also includes the winery? It also includes the winery. Thank you. Okay, other questions related to dogs. 
it's not that we don't love your dogs. It's just, you know, when you live in this type of environment, we have to have rules so that everyone can um, live in a harmonious way. Okay, red alert system. I just want to mention the red alert system briefly, um, and that's your pendant alarm. Some of you have the necklace, and I believe some of you have the wristband. I'm learning because every, every community has different features of the pendant alarm. Um, but I want to share how that works. So if you should push your red alert, we ask you to hold it for about five seconds, and that then that signal comes to our main um, computer. We have a computerized system that tracks it. And then we have um, actually pagers that we have our nurse wear as well as security. When that comes through, we're going to call you first if that pennant shows you're likely in your apartment. It, it gives us a general vicinity of your location, and if it shows that you're in your apartment, we'll call the apartment first. If you don't answer, then we will go up and check on you. Reason for the call is a lot of you will accidentally push it, not realizing. And I, I can tell you I read the security logs in the morning when I come in, and there's at least one or two, maybe three, sometimes four false alarms per day. And that's because they're sensitive and you accidentally push it and we're gonna get the alarm. So we call first and then we will um, go up if you do not answer. Um, so that's kind of the process. And um, we, we will begin to talk more about the red alerts. Um, we, if you're outside, they don't always work outside, but in the buildings, they should give us a general vicinity. But outside, do not rely on your red alert, rely on your cell phone. So we, you know, 99% of us carry cell phones, so carry yours with you. And if you're outside and you have an injury, accident, or fall, uh, call 911 or call our main phone number if you're not injured. Um, but you're on the ground and need some assistance, um, call us and then we'll come to your location outside. Any questions? Yes, we have a question. It's actually a, a comment but, uh, to remind people, if they're in a particular public space, there's usually another um, alarm on the wall somewhere in that room and that will bring the people faster if you don't push and a lot of people push their alarm for another person on the floor and they really shouldn't do that it just sends people to the wrong direction and so if they're in if they're in a room see where the alarm is and go over and push it that's an excellent suggestion i'm looking for the one here ross okay sign above them but they're they're in the corners and they say alert on them okay good so um we will have the red postings to help really push you know draw your attention to them i think a good practice and this is a practice with fire alarms as well is to know where you're you know you're in the airplane and they say look around <laughs> and see where your nearest exit is i think that's a good practice look you know when you're in a building look where your exits are in case there's a fire and you need to get out. Um, look where your pull stations are in case there's a fire and you can pull the pull station, but also know where the alerts are, especially in the dining rooms, in the, um, in the auditorium, in the common areas. And again, the great suggestion, push, um, if it's not you with the emergency, push the, your friend's wristband or their pen alarm or the, the room alarm. Um, because sometimes we'll be looking for Mrs. Jones when it's really Mrs. Smith who needs the attention. So, good suggestion. Okay, um, I want to switch gears and share with you a short slideshow. Oh, one more question, I'm sorry. 
It's more of a comment than a question. I found that when I pushed the button, it took a very long time for someone to answer. And when they did, and I explained what the problem was, her, the nurse, I think it was the nurse in Willowbrook, it was on Sunday, just said, call 911. I said, I would like you to come down and just reassure me, take my blood pressure. She said, no, I can't, just call 911. Okay, well, I'm sorry that you had that experience. And um, what we plan on doing is that every red alert, if, there's, if someone has a situation or experience like that, I'd ask you to call me or call Ross, um, because Ross and I work um, on the red alerts together. We both get the security logs. Ross works directly with security, who is part of the team, to respond. And then I work with um, Oak Bridge Terrace, who are the nurses who respond in the evenings um, to the red alert. So we ask that you, um, when that, if that happens, and hopefully that won't happen often, but if it did happen, we would want to know so we can identify the nurse, why, you know, what was the situation, and then um, correct that situation. So thank you for sharing. Okay, so I want to um, switch gears to um, speak about diversity and inclusion. So um, ACTS Retirement Life Communities is um, focusing on diversity and inclusion. And I want to share a, a statement that was developed by ACTS. Um, so I need to put my glasses on to read it. Um, but this is their statement about diversity and inclusion. It says, in keeping with the teachings of our Christian heritage, meaning Acts, Christian heritage, and the culture of loving kindness, Acts is committed to the belief that every person is equally created in the image of God, a basic human identity, and that all individuals shall be treated with respect and dignity, regardless of their religion, race, national origin, color, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, age, or other unique attributes. This commitment to inclusion and diversity goes to the core of our beliefs. So with that, we are creating, they have created actually a, a diversity and inclusion council. And um, the council is, uh, the goals of the council are to bring residents and team members, meaning staff, together to share ideas and collaborate, to gain resident and team member feedback and perspective on diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and how to promote and maintain a diverse and inclusive environment. Uh, we want to discuss meaningful ways to celebrate our residents and team members and their diversity and uniqueness, to collaborate on ideas for diversity and inclusion, to celebrate throughout the year, and to partner on education and learning opportunities related to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And so there's a difference between the three um, um, names or three ideas, diversity, um, what is diversity? There are differences. So diversity has three different components. One is personality, meaning the type of person you are, are you an introvert, are you an extrovert? Um, how do you communicate, what's your style, and what's your temperament? Internal factors on the right-hand side um, is stuff that we can't really change, our age, our gender, how we see ourselves sexually, um, our orientation, race, physical attributes, and our abilities or disabilities. And then on the left are our societal factors, you know, our religion, our nationality, how we're educated, our socioeconomic status, our income, marital status, or our, the job we hold. So these are, this is kind of what makes us all diverse. It's not just one factor, it's many factors. And that's why we're all so unique, and we're, we're unique um, 
And so because of that, we want to um, include people. And so what is inclusion? So inclusion is about an action or behavior that we take to create an environment um, where individuals and groups feel welcomed, respected and supported, and valued for their full authentic selves to the workplace or to our community. So if you're a resident, you feel valued. If you're an employee, you feel valued. Um, inclusion is also an action taken to ensure that residents and team members, they feel valued, trusted, heard, and they are seen as individuals and that we celebrate that we're all unique. And then um, the last is belonging. What is belonging? And belonging is a feeling. So belonging is feeling that the community, um, that there's a community with people and environments that make us feel connected. So we feel connected to Edgewater or we feel connected as a resident group. Uh, belonging also means that everyone is treated and feels like a full member, whether or not you're a resident or team member, and that you can thrive in the environment. So the goals are lofty, <laughs> and we know that um, this is a journey, um, and it's a marathon, not a sprint, but we do want to um, have a community that creates diversity, um, and we include people, and um, individuals feel like they belong. So with that, um, here's some examples of how we would celebrate diversity. Um, so residents might go to a museum that showcases a, a certain culture. We might attend a cultural art exhibit. Uh, we might um, host a multicultural movie here on campus or we could have a potluck um, for different cultures or nationalities. And so with this in mind, we're going to have a diversity, inclusion, and belonging committee here on campus, and the committee will comprise of both residents and staff. Uh, we would like five to six residents and five to six employees who will come together and create a culture um, help us create a culture of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And um, I will share with you that when I was at St. Andrews Estates, they were a pilot for this. And so for about a year now, they've had the committee. And it works really well. And we don't have to follow what they did. We can have our own journey, and we can create our own committee and create how we see it as a, a community. But what I'm asking is for residents who have a passion for this topic um, to raise your hand, and not today, but to raise your hand and let us know that you would like to um, perhaps participate on the committee. And we'll have an introductory um, committee session so that even if you raise your hand and you come to the session and you say, well, that's really not what I thought it was about, I'm gonna decline, that's fine. But we. We would like um, to invite you, if you're interested, to participate. And um, I'll share just quickly, because we have a other topics to talk about. But over at um, St. Andrews, for example, we have a, a board that's in the lobby, and it's on both sides of the campus. And that board highlights whatever we're trying to share. So it could be educational. Um, in nature, and so for example, we um, highlighted a Native American who was the first U.S. Congresswoman um, who served our country. And we, we were highlighting Native Americans that month, and th we showed what her successes were, how she was able to become a U.S. Congresswoman, and we highlighted her accomplishments. So that's just an e easy example of what we're trying to achieve because sometimes we're not, um, we are not exposed to different cultures or different um, lifestyles. And once we're exposed and we understand people differently, we immediately have a connection with them because we are interconnected. Um, and that's what we're hoping to achieve is interconnection and belonging. So if you're interested, 
um, let us know and we will um, in invite you. We're gonna meet in April, so we'll do it after all the holidays are over, but we will have a meeting and then we'll launch the committee and it really is a lot of fun. There's um, a lot of fun and there's some uncomfortable um, topics that are discussed in that meeting and that's okay. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to get uncomfortable to become comfortable. And so the idea is let's get comfortable with each other and let's, um, let's accept people for who they are and let's, let's belong as a, a community. Any comments or questions on that? Okay, <laughs> so we'll move along. Um, we also have an Act Sustainability Committee, and we would like to find one resident who would um, become our cheerleader here or champion sustainability, which is not just recycling, but it's um, you know solar energy. It's it's ways to um, conserve energy, ways to um, to improve conservation efforts. So if any of you are interested in being our champion, uh, that individual would work with Ross and myself um, through ACTS because ACTS has a committee and we would, um, we would actually have that resident help us with our efforts here on campus. So if you're interested, um, call Ross or call myself and we'll, um, we'll get you connected. Thank you. Olympiacs, um, we have Olympiacs at Azalea Trace on May 16th and 17th, thank you, Leah. I put 16 on here, 17. Okay, we get there on the 16th, but the 17th is a competition, thank you. We're having a challenge getting participation. Part of that is because of the long drive and we recognize that the long drive is going to be difficult, but we will have um, stops along the way. We'll have um, food, I'm sure. We're going to try to make it as pleasurable as possible for the drive. Um, we um, think it will be a lot of fun. You'll also get to see another campus, so you'll get to see Azalea Trace and you know compare notes and see how how their community looks and what, what they have that maybe we could incorporate here. So, you know, it should be fun. And we are going to take home the gold, too. Um, so we're asking you to please um, take one for the team <laughs> and um, commit to going with us. And if you would, would do that, we would certainly appreciate it. We will have a lot of fun. And um, see Leah if um, you would like to um, commit and we're just looking to to win those uh, gold medals any questions on that okay um, a building so we're pretty much done with the renovations in a building but we are waiting on furniture to arrive so as soon as we know of the del delivery date we'll let you know we are going to be selling most of the furniture that is in those hallways, and that money will go to the Axe Legacy Foundation for special projects here on our campus. So it'll be earmarked for Edgewater, and we'll use that money um, for special small projects uh, that we might want to do here. So just to let you know what's happening there. Okay, artwork in the hallway. Um, in the past, we have allowed residents to put some of their personal artwork out in the hallway, but we're gonna go ahead and, and no longer have that as a practice. Um, so if your artwork's already up, your, your grandfather did, we're not gonna ask to take it down, but going forward, we're gonna have, try to have a consistent theme in the hallways. And so therefore, um, we will not have personal artwork um, up in the hallways unless it's already up. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, so let's see, the gazebo project. A lot of you came to the gazebo opening and the ribbon cutting. Um, again, I wanna thank Herb Jacobson and all the donors who um, made generous um, don donations for the gazebo project. 
we would love to use that space, not just for afternoon card playing, but um, perhaps if you have a, a special party and you wanna have a dinner out in that area, we can accommodate dinners out there and um, use it to um, our advantage. It was so lovely. We had a, a private dinner to thank the donors um, last week and we ended up just sitting out there till like 8.30, 9 o'clock when none of us left. And um, it was just so nice. You can hear the fountain in the back. You can, you can hear the water and the sky was beautiful. The weather was a little on the chilly side, um, but we just enjoyed the space. And I would encourage you if you have a special anniversary or birthday coming up and you wanna have a small intimate party um, or dinner, that's the place to have it. And especially during the winter months um, before it gets too hot. But um, let us know if you wanna use the space, let the culinary team know and we can work with you on um, using that space. So it's a great addition and we hope it um, gets used uh, for years to come. The rehab renovations. So most of you probably know the therapy um, gym. We're gonna have a new therapy gym that will be located in C building on the first floor and that will be for occupational, physical and speech therapy. Right now, um, residents who use outpatient come up here to this corner of our building um, for therapy. Well, we'll have a new gym um, downstairs as well. And then part of this will still be open, but not the entire um, portion of this. So that's going, that renovation will start in April. So you'll start seeing some movement there. Um, I wanted to share, and I think it was um, on the portal, but um, Reverend George Gunn, who is a um, former CEO and vice chair of the board of directors for um, ACTS. Some of you who have been here for many years will remember that name, um, but Reverend George Gunn passed away on March 8th, and he was very instrumental in the earlier years of ACTS. Um, just want to um, fondly remember him and express our gratitude for um, his signature that he left on our community as well as the organization. The last item I have before we open the meeting up is uh, regarding volunteers, and I'm looking at Mary Lou. And I mentioned this um, the other day. We're having a volunteer appreciation lunch. Mary Lou, what date is that, April? April 20th. So you've been, if you volunteer, you've received an invite. Um, please come, we'll have a lot of fun and the food I promise is gonna be great. Um, but volunteering here on campus, there's going to be a different way of tracking the hours. Um, every community is gonna have a new way to track the hours and Mary Lou's doing this with her head, which I don't blame her. <laughs> Um, but it's going to be rolled out probably mid-year uh, this year, but we'll, more to come um, about that, but there will be a new tracking mechanism. And uh, we... That's right. <laughs> the only thing that's guaranteed is change in this world, right? <laughs> so... Okay, with that, I'd like to open the meeting up to other topics, suggestions, or comments. Out of time, please. I'd like to ask, and if this sounds like rabble rousing, it's intentional. I'd like to ask when, oh when, will those obnoxious, embarrassing, useless, and needless prices on our dinner menus disappear. Um, they serve no purpose locally. We're not on a point system. Uh, they're just an annoyance, a recent annoyance that we don't need. And I would ask everybody in this room who agrees with me to applaud my question. All righty. <laughs> so, um, so that, there, there are a couple um, 
down the road, there probably will be a point system for newer residents, but that's not here yet. So we can talk about what we do in the interim, but eventually those prices probably will need to be posted. Um, but right now, they're, it's not n totally needed. So let me talk to Darren. Um, now, I am away next week. Um, you know, I come here and now I'm away. <laughs> but I'm away for our leadership conference. So once a year, um, we have a leadership conference where we are trained on specific um, leadership um, skills, if you will, and next week is the week. So when I get back the following week, I will meet with Darren and we'll talk about the menus and what we can do to maybe soften that message or even maybe remove it on most of them but have some with the pricing. So we'll look at that. I know we've heard that um, from residents eventually we will probably need to have some menus with pricing but we're not there yet because of um, down the road as you know new um, contracts are are made and I don't know when that will happen if it will happen now you know when I say now I mean in the near future or 10 years from now, but contracts always change with meal service. So years ago, we had two meals per day. You got two meals per day. Now it's one meal. So the meal service always changes um, throughout the evolution of communities similar to this. Okay. Would older residents be able to opt in to it? Well, I, I'm not saying it's even here yet. I'm just saying that eventually, the, when you brought up the point system, that's a good reason to have them. So eventually, that might be a reason why we would have them. And that's all. That was all I was suggesting is that you know, as the the industry as a whole evolves, culinary always evolves with it. So that could be a potential. But I, I don't know specifically how existing residents um, culinary features would change uh, if they if we in fact go that route Susan I want to share this with everybody here I did share it with the culinary committee my son-in-law's father lives in a continuous care retirement community not an axe community in um, Pittsburgh it is a gorgeous place it is magnificently decorated and very opulent. Uh, during COVID, their food service was curtailed. Um, at one point, the dining room was serving meals. At one point, the dining room was serving seven days a week. Then the dining room went serving five days a week. Then it went down to three days a week. And it went down to three days a week with robots because they couldn't get servers. So they had these little R2-D2 type robots with iPad. You put stuff on it, maybe you got your meal and maybe you didn't. <laughs> then it went down to Sunday brunch. Now they have no meal service. Wow. The dining room is closed. They have a grab and go that is brought in by an outside agency. So those of you who are complaining about the food, be careful what you say and what you wish for because it can happen, and it has happened. Wow, well thank you for that um, cautionary tale. In respect to guests who come for dinner, why can't we just have a, a, a flat rate Whatever, uh, it could be $22, it could be $25, but a flat rate so we know what we are being charged for instead of uh, banana, which is $2. Uh, <laughs> I heard 250 but. <laughs> right. And, and we don't know whether that's a whole thing of bananas or one. I banana. think it's one. <laughs> Okay, so we did have the flat rate, and what we found is that it limited our ability to maybe have upscale op options that were a little more costly, and so down the road, we want to be able to have a la carte um, dining options so that um, guests can choose either very upscale items or more just normal 
the way we normally every day, if you will. So that's why the the um, the per meal or the per entree or per item um, was introduced. And down the road, not everyone's going to want to eat a soup, a salad, a main course, and dessert. And so, I mean, we're seeing the future is going to be more a la carte options, and people will choose based on their budgetary restraints or, or goals. I mean, some people just are frugal, and they don't need to be, but that's how they live, and that's their lifestyle, and that's respectable. And um, so the, op the, the value of each meal is different based on the type of food that is being, um, being served. Not that that's a great answer, but that's the reason behind it. Before we go, let me get one more question to make sure, and I'll bring it back to you, I promise. Let me see, anyone else have a question? Anyone else? Let me, I'll bring it right back to you. It's a great one opportunity. One second. I, hi. Uh, I've been here three years, and we have a website which is doing very well. But I have been asking for more technical help. We have one person every other week for one hour. I think in the world we live in now, we need more uh, assistance in learning more and knowing more things. And I know Ellen has been promoting this also, but why can't we have someone who's more available? Okay, so I mean, I think that's a good point, and we can accomplish that in a few different ways. One way is we can bring outside um, teachers in to do small classes in here. We can do that, and whether that's, you know, and I'm just, don't shoot the messenger here, but whether that's if you participate, you pay a small fee to attend, or whether that's paid for by acts, you know, we would have to look at how that works because we have, you know, we have a pot of gold, if you will, that we can spend on activities, entertainment, theater, um, special um, guest speakers. So we have to use our money wisely, and we have to say, you know, how many people does this benefit? Does it make sense to not charge? Does it make sense to have an upcharge for a certain? technology training program. So we can look at it that way, or we can have a general training program here, or we can ask Marcus if he can provide additional um, seminars for us. So I think there's three ways we can um, address that, and I'll ask Ellen to look to incorporate all three ways so that we have more opportunities for you. I love to um, learn how to better use the email system we use because we have we get so many emails every day and I um, I try to learn how to make it more efficient for me and so um, I think regardless of where you are in the technology um, phase of your life we can always learn and there's always shortcuts and ways to make um, technology your friends so we'll try to enhance what we're doing here Thank you. One more. I've got two more. Two more. Sorry, here. Here, I'm going to come to you, man. I haven't forgotten about you. Hi. If I have a guest, I don't want them to see prices. I'm going to treat them. I don't care if I'm charged. That's perfectly fine. But to see the prices there, it cheapens everything. So when you have a guest, um, what I would ask you to do is go up to the podium and just say, please give me menus without pricing on it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll do that. Thank you. Yes, you can, you can have that. They are available now. They are available yes. now, correct. Now so if you don't want pricing on your menu, just say, could I have a menu without pricing? Do, do we give you the menus at the table? Yeah, yeah. At the table, okay. So we'll have to figure out how to do that where it's not embarrassing. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a comment. We're talking a lot about the cost of things, etc. And it seems to me that uh, a lot of people feel they need to get their money's worth, so to speak. And so when you take six cups of coffee home from the lobby coffee urn, and when you remove salt and pepper shakers from the table, and 
silverware and et cetera. I want everybody to know we're all paying for that. When you open your window while your air conditioner is on, we're all paying for that. And so I think um, when you, you were talking about a committee earlier in terms of new technology, et cetera, but there's so many things that we ourselves could do to improve uh, how much things cost these days. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands whenever you take something that is really not yours or if you feel you need to get your money's worth, you're not. You're paying more. You will pay for it. And we and the rest of us will pay for it as well. Thank you, Marlon. And that's true. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I know we, you know, some of us, Sometimes we'll um, do things and not think through it, but that's a good, good reminder that um, what you pay. I mean, if you don't need it, don't order it. So if you're really not hungry, don't order all courses. But if you are hungry, order all courses. So we're not um, denying you um, pleasure and your right to have all courses, but certainly um, good you know, we're paying for that. And when I say we, I mean you as a resident are paying for that. So that's a great reminder. Uh, I would like to uh, commend Ellen Lefkowitz here. For those of you who are on the go, we're always willing to go on the go. She has created a program and an attitude of accommodation to people that I just think is unusual, and I would I'd like to see more of that being done here, because whatever we ask for, she has come through, or attempted to come through, and I th just wanted to make note of that, because it's just been a pleasure to deal with her. Thank you. Yeah, in, in, the short, in the short time that I've worked with Alan here, a uh, very short time I've worked with Alan here, I am amazed at how cheerful she is, how bubbly she is, and she uses laughter as the best medicine. I mean, she, she, when, we, when we go and sit down and have lunch, she is the first to laugh or first to chuckle about something that's, you know, and she, she, it's contagious, and I think she brings out the best um, in all of us, and I think she works really hard to um, have um, opportunities so residents can be fully engaged while they live here. So we are very blessed to have Alan, and thank you for recognizing that. Uh, I have a question going back to the menus, okay? We do have a culinary committee, and Prior, in prior years, when we were able to have guests, there was a flat rate for, a, for dinner for a, adults, and we knew what it was, which I think this, the other resident that spoke before um, was trying to convey. But is it um, a, a decision that the culinary committee would make with Darren and possibly you? you to go back to that? Yeah, no, that's a decision above the culinary committee. Um, that's a, a, a community-wide, um, all of acts has gone to the a la carte pricing. And, um, but we can talk about the menus, whether or not the pricing currently should be on there, we can take it off. Um, and then anyone who wants to see the menus with pricing, we can certainly have some with the pricing. Uh, the pricing really affects your um, guest meals, not your meals. So um, we can certainly look at that. And we'll work with the culinary committee. Now, just to remind everyone, the committees are advisory um, in nature. So don't beat up the culinary committee. If you go to the culinary committee and they say, we want whatever, and it doesn't happen, it's their advisory. But we do listen to them, and they do have a good pulse for the, the community and what you want to see, what you don't want to see. If we had a really bad meal and that happens, we have good meals, and sometimes we have really bad meals. We want to hear that. And the committee does influence our 
our response. Um, so, but, but certainly if you say, I told the committee and it never happened, it doesn't mean they didn't bring it forward. Um, it just means that they, some things we agree that we need to change and other things we might say we can't and here's why. Um, so they are advisory, they're a great committee. I know it's newly formed, I know there's new members on the committee. We're gonna support that committee and work with all committees. So if a resident committee um, comes to us, we're gonna do our level best to partner with them. Um, and if we're able to do you know, suggestions, we will. If we're not, we'll at least try to attempt to explain why. Um, but don't beat any of your committees up because they are they work very hard on um, on your behalf and they are volunteering and and they're um, trying to be the voice for the community and we certainly appreciate it and culinary has a rough time I mean we all have I can tell you I hate meatloaf my husband loves it um, if I'm gonna have meatloaf I want mushrooms in it my husband hates mushrooms um, so it's it's all personal preferences and it's style of cooking. If you if you were raised in one part of the country, you might like things done a certain way, and if you're raised in another part of the country, you want it definitely done differently. So we all come diversity. You know, we all come with diverse individual backgrounds. Culinary is a really hard um, service to accomplish 100% satisfaction, which we all know. There's no perfection in this lifetime, but we will certainly strive for perfection and we'll work our level best to, to work with all the committees. So I think with that, we can wrap it up. Um, we're gonna, we have um, one little small raffle. Um, we have a little coffee mug <laughs> that says ax on it. We'll try to um, have a small raffle to draw the crowds. It's your red tickets, the red tickets that you received on the way in. Ready? Okay, Grab so the, the winner of the coffee mug is 043796. 043796. Oh, okay, she, we got a winner. You, you almost yes, you almost left. Give a round of applause. You see, I would have drank your coffee. I would have drank oh. coffee from your mug um, tomorrow morning. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you and getting to know you. Thanks for have coming and have a great day.